Chapter 16 The Nightmare The luggage was still open on the bed, with everything neatly packed inside. The light in the room was off, but the one in the bathroom was projecting a long jet of light on the luggage and on Ginny, making her golden eyes gleaming in the semi-darkness and the red eyelashes glimmering like many little flames. Harry was prodded up on his elbow observing her body, her chest going up and down slowly with her breathing, sliding lazily his hand on her soft skin, tracing every curve that would meet his fingers. He was one of those moments, right after having made love, in which he could enjoy the simple pleasure without feeling lust growing in him. He could observe her, only severing the pleasure of looking at something beautiful without feeling any need attached to it. He could cherish the fairness of her skin under his hands as only something soothing and relaxing. He gave him a rare moment of peace, bound to last only a short, precious time. I'll miss you, he whispered, lying down beside her. She smiled, turning her head to look at him. It's only one week. It will feel like a lifetime. It's still only one week. Harry didn't answer, rolling onto his back and staring at the ceiling. It was only a week, it was true, but for him, not accustomed in staying without her, was going to be a very long week indeed. Jenny, sensing his despondency, lay her head on his chest. You can take one of my dresses, spray it with one of my perfumes and pretend it's me. She said, laughing softly. Harry chuckled. I might actually do that, you know. It's about a good idea. He said, fiddling with the lock of her hair. They were lying there, without speaking, enjoying the warmth of each other's body, when a terrified shriek pierced the stillness. He was followed straight away by a tearful wail. Mommy! Daddy! Harry and Ginny sighed and said in unanimity, a nightmare. Harry kissed Ginny on the forehead. Don't worry, I'll go, he said, grasping a pair of sweet pants. She must sleep in her bed, Ginny warned. Harry smirked and glancing at her naked body, an electric quiver told him that the soothing golden moment had irrevocably passed. You betcha, he said naughtily. Ginny sniggered and grasping the duvet, disappeared underneath. From Sunrise Room, a steady whimpering could be heard, broken by some more prayer for them. Harry switched on the light in her room. She was in a sea of tears, shaking like a leaf, whining piteously for him and clutching convulsively her teddy. Softened by the side, he sat on the bed and scooped her up. What's wrong, sweetie? A nightmare? The bad man! She wailed, still trembling, crouching in a bell on his lap. Always this bad man, isn't he? He said wearily, covering her with the bed blanket. You dream of it quite often. He wants to hurt you, daddy! She whimpered, her lips wobbling and her green eyes full of tears and fears on him. He held her tight, trying to calm her. It was only a dream, Siri. It doesn't mean anything. Although, not understanding why, the word dream triggered a creep that drove along his spine. It took him a long moment to realize why and put the pieces together. Normal dreams didn't mean anything, but her dreams could actually mean something. He and Ginny were so accustomed to her nightmares that never gave them much importance imputing them to a childish whim of sleeping in their bed. But having recently gained a new awareness of their possible meaning, if indeed genuine, the whole thing took a total new significance. They were happening with an alarming frequency, especially in the last few weeks, and they always involved this bad man, wanting to hurt him most often, but other members of the family too. A cold sweat, placed his body while making this consideration, 
He looked at Sunrise still whimpering, and the fear that gripped him made him almost want to run out from the room in an attempt to escape what scared him. But running away from a whimpering child would have solved the problem. He gathered his strength and gulped, afraid to ask what he knew he must. So, what happened in the dream? But his child was unable to answer. She shook her head, not enough word in her still scanty vocabulary, not a mature enough mind to transform what she saw in intelligible sentences, and was only able to stammer, He's wicked. Her eyes were very expressive, however, and Harry read in them something scary, something violent, whose sunrise didn't understand in the first place. Those eyes became a mirror of his fears and brought to his mind all his nightmares about the graveyard. Locked in that reciprocal gaze, Harry was suddenly aware that his daughter knew of those nightmares. When Ginny woke him up while screaming and trashing, Sunrise was screaming also. He didn't realize it back then, all caught by his fears, but he realized it now. Her daughter was leaving them with him. And unable to explain her nightmare, she was visualizing those like the most similar thing to something she had never experienced in her short life. Harry, opposite to her, was unable to see what she saw in her sleep, but could, nevertheless, add certain hypotheses. Because the fright in her eyes, the fear she felt, was the same he, he experienced when waking up from one of those nightmares. Siri, what has he done? He asked urgently. Who does he want to hurt? Only me? And asking that question, he was praying for a positive answer, because with the knowledge, he could live. He knew to be always in danger. He was full of dark wizard wanting to hurt him. He wasn't a new notion, nor an astounding one. His job was to make sure that they would never see the sun again in Azkaban. There were plenty of wizards there and outside who wished nothing better than to hurt him. Although, Sarah shook her head confused. Who? Did you see? Jenny, she stammered scared, looking about the room, heaving deeply. I'll be she continued, starting to fret, snuggling against him. Me, she murmured, her eyes filling with tears. Mummy, she concluded, starting to shake again. Chapter 17 The Capture The corridor was long and dark. They were moving swiftly, without making any sound. Carol was walking beside Harry, two other hours behind them. He had chosen the best to accompany him, but the whole team was waiting outside if needed. Ginny had left two days before, and Harry was glad of it. Glad she was on the other side of the planet, far away, out of danger. James and Albus were at Hogwarts, the safest place to where to have them. Nobody could touch them there. As an added precaution, however, mindful about the easiness in which Sirius had managed to get into the castle and lure him out in his third year, had asked and obtained from McGonagall permission to send a couple of hours in disguise to have them followed in their whereabouts. They obviously had to be kept in the dark, not to be alarmed by this proceeding. Soon after Ginny was gone, he had been to pick Sunrise up from the kindergarten, informed the teacher that for a while they would have kept her at home, and left her to the exclusive care of Molly and Arthur. He hadn't explained why, and he didn't inquire, think he had done it to please them. They had been much disappointed by their decision of sending her to kindergarten, and they were always begging to have her there. Without their knowledge, all the protective spells he could think of had been casted on the house and on them. He still wasn't sure how much to believe about Sunrise's prophecy nature, but he didn't want to take any useless risk. That night, he had tried to have a better inside, but Sunrise hadn't been able to give any. Harry 
was basing all his speculation and setting all his hopes on the fact that she had used the words want to her and not hurt. It wasn't much to build on, especially because Sarah's was still in the phase where mistakes in speaking were common, but not having anything else to cling to, he decided to believe the difference crucial. Nothing was written yet, and everything could change. And he was ready to fight to death, not to have it written. He had worked himself to exhaustion, but it had borne fruit. The inferior guy was under siege, and unawarely so. His seconds counted. It was going to end that day. The corridor terminated with a flight of stairs going down. The walls were sprayed off, dirty, covered with graffiti. It was a disused factory in the north, a forsaken place, dangerous, damp. Moss was blowing corners, rubbish and traces of fire everywhere. The flight of stairs had been skillfully concealed to Muggle's eyes and to most of the magical population would have been invisible likewise, but not to an hour of strained eye. Seeing that place, it was easy to understand why the disappearances had almost ceased. Most of the people who took refuge there were rejected of muggle society, people nobody noticed the disappearance of homeless, junkies, criminals time to time. Not all of them, however, and the wizard should have been a bit more careful in choosing its victims. That place was frequented by young people in quest for adventure, exploration parties of muggles who wanted some nice shots of an Ambadon place, or simply the gusto of the adrenaline ringing being in a forbidden dangerous place. Some of those disappearances had been reported, and through research, Harry had nailed the place. They descended for quite a while, Darkness swallowing everything, making it necessary to drop the wall, not to stumble. They didn't dare to light any of their wands for fear to be discovered. They had only one shot. They couldn't allow themselves any full step. The stairs ended in a long corridor. On one end, a door was ajar, and a flimsy dancing orange light came from behind. The smell was strong and pungent. The floor was damp and slimy, and they had to walk extra carefully not to make any splashing noise. By the weak light, they could see the water gleaming, and puddles of darker liquids filtering from the closed doors on either side of the corridor. Harry stooped down to have a better look, and brushed his finger on the ground. It was water mixed with blood. The hair was stale, and humidity so high that despite being still winter, they were all sweating profusely. It wasn't a coincidence. It would have made lighting a fire very difficult, and that was one of the few things Inferi were afraid of. He gestured to the other arrows to be ready, wand in hand. The place was brimming dark magic. Harry could sense it all around. He could even see it as light blurring in the hair right in front of him. It wasn't easy to discern, but to an hour it was unmistakable. He halted, his eyes darting left, right and center, trying to understand what it was and how to pass it unscathed. He didn't have much time to ponder over it. Every second could reveal their present, thinning their chances of success. Surely, he was going to neutralize any protection charm or disillusionment charm. It was a classic and they didn't even think to protect themselves in any way. It was never an option. But there was something else. Surely an alarm of some kind, and none of them could fool themselves in not imagining what was hidden behind all those closed doors, ready to awaken by their presence, a present that would have been known as soon as they would step through the barrier. Something else was hidden, but Harry couldn't put his finger on it. He was sure that having time to analyze it properly, he would have guessed and probably annihilate in a matter of minutes, although he didn't have that luxury. Only a nod to his crew was needed. They were all getting to the same conclusion. They worked elbow to elbow with Harry for so long that they were capable to interpret any slight gesture he addressed them. They had been trained by him, all accustomed to take quick resolution, to keep a cold mind in front of danger, and to be ready to risk it all. 
they started to run toward the door at the end of the corridor. Each one of them, passing the barrier, got sucked completely by water, making the casting of any fire spells almost impossible to achieve. Grunts and swishing sprouted all around them, coming from the different rooms. And when they reached the light, the creaking of doors being opened was audible. The two arrows closing the light turned to face what was advancing, determined to buy time for Harry and Carol on front. Harry kicked the door open, his wand ready, shouting a warning to the wizard inside. The man lurched in surprise and darted from his chair, backing against the wall. He was short, lanky, with sand blonde hair that almost covered his dark eyes. Before their coming, he was bent on his desk, scribbling with his quill on some parchment. The room was scanty and gloomy, the walls yellow and dirty. A long sturdy wood table was taking a big part of it. Resting on it, there was a naked body, pallid and rigid in its death. It had already been deprived of both legs and arms, the lie orderly on one side. Some other limbs were dangling from hooks protruding from under the table's rims. A bucket positioned under it was collecting the blood that was dripping from a hole under the body. A scene of that kind would have given a strong sickness to the toughest of men, but it didn't affect Harry that much. He had witnessed that and worse doing his job. He made a quick assessment of everything surrounding him and of the wizard. In his surprise, he had left his wand on the desk and was too far from him. As he was about to cast a spell to immobilize him, he found himself thrusted roughly in the room by the arrow behind him that had been hit by an eight feet infery. None lost their balance. With a flip, they were back on their feet, but that distraction had been enough to give the wizard the chance to lunge on his wand. Carola was soon on him with a spell that was parried easily. Harry was about to help out, but under his eyes a ghastly vision appeared on the door. The inferies were disgusting. Their putrid skin was dangling from their body, revealing no muscle. They were all freakishly tall, and the juncture on their bodies were low rimmed with black stitches. Their mouth half open as in stupor, and the eyes, the ones who still had them, were glazed by a hollow emptiness. They advanced steadily, notwithstanding the two hours' effort, and it was clear very soon that they were greatly outnumbered. One hour was trying to cast a fire without success, and the other was attempting some slashing spells that had very little effect on those magical modified bodies. Harry saw the necessity to call for help, and the only way was a Patronus. It was never easy to cast one under mind-challenging situation, but he couldn't allow himself to fail. He swept away the reality he was living, he cancelled the inference from his mind, the mutilated corpse on the table, the dangerous wizard behind him casting spell after spell trying to escape, and found himself sitting in his living room. Sunrise on his lap, showing him the flower she had drawn. He was running with James sat down in the wood, he was flying on the Thames with Albus and Nathan, and he was in the kitchen with Jimmy, washing dishes while joking and laughing, her golden eyes full of mirth and love on him. The phoenix unfolded its wings on their heads, its silvery light blinding them for a moment in the darkness of the room. A cringing anger and growl rose from the inse- from- <coughs> rose from the inferies, the winds crouching and covering clumsily their faces and bodies from light. Harry was already triumphing, but it was, unfortunately, a triumph of short duration. On hearing the dark wizard mirthless laugh, he saw the phonics colliding and fading against the barrier. Darkness fell again, and the closest infery, already stead on his feet, swiftly tried to strike him. He ducked just in time, but he was left with no choice but to join his colleagues finding a way to neutralize them hoping that Carola would have let the guy escape. After what it seemed ages, but could only be a few minutes of dodging blows and casting spells with little or no effect, he heard a shout, and Carola shouting his name. 
He turned just in time to see her being attacked from an infery, and the dark wizard with a smirk on his face pointing his wand against her. Collecting all his strength, he front kicked at the infery he was fighting against in the stomach. It was only pushed back a foot, but that was all he needed. Covering quickly the short space separating him from the wizard, he gathered again all his strength and with a jump kick well aimed, hit the wizard's wrist, making his wand fly far from his end. A crack and a piercing scream announced him that the guy wouldn't be able to, to hold it again for a while. As a safe measure, taking him by the neck and hooking his leg to nail him on the ground, he stomped on the other wrist, crushing that too. He finished the whole thing with body binding jeans, praising the wizard in his agonizing scream. The situation was desperate. They were all surrounded, trying without effort to bring down the Inferi's army. He had left instruction to the arrows outside to join them upon not seeing them out in a matter of minutes. But unfortunately, he realized a matter of minutes was going to be definitely too long a time. They still had only a matter of seconds before to meet a very unpleasant end. No spell seemed to have more than a momentary effect on them. No fires could be summoned in the damp environment. None except one, and Harry took his resolution. He shouted to his colleague to be ready to retreat. He had only seconds to carry out his plan. A new phoenix shot from his wand, circling in the room. The inferi soul winced. Follow it! Harry shouted as the phoenix was heading toward the stair. He shot a second one to give them more time. They scampered quickly out of the room, protected from the luminous scent birds, who were fast losing contour, the dark magic so strong affecting their shine. They were all approaching the stairs, and Harry shot the last one. Carola, before to disappear, looked behind her, sure to find Harry tailing. But when she realized he was in the case, as Harry had only advanced as far as the threshold of the room infested by inferies, faltered. Him, perceiving it, gestured her firmly to go, in order she knew she had no choice but to follow. When she disappeared, he mastered his resolution and did the only thing he could think to destroy all those monsters. A dangerous resolution that could have easily costed him his life. He took a second to concentrate and performed a difficult piece of magic. He was dark magic, powerful and difficult to tame. He never used dark magic if it could be avoided, but that didn't mean he wasn't able to. He only decided not to. But sometimes evil could be swept away only using the same evil. Only when the dark, uncontrollable wild beast made of thin fire left his wand to attack whatever matter chose, his eyes rested on the petrified figure still crouched on the floor. He hesitated, a hesitation that could have proved fatal in such moment. Throw the man, many muggles and magical people had perished. Three of his best colleagues had perished. He thought about his visits to their families, the unabridged sorrow he had to witness, the threat to his family, and hardening against him was about to turn his heels and leave him to his destiny, but at that moment their guises crossed, and Harry read there that fear of death, who united all men, and damning himself for his excess of humanity, dodging a vile giant snake who darted against him, he shot in the room, lifted the paralyzing spell, and prodding him on his feet, carried him on his shoulder, and ran toward the stairs, knowing that a wrong step on the slippery floor, it would result in both their death. The beasts, who had already consumed the shrieking inferis, were tailing them, and Harry could feel the scorching heat lambing his ankles while flying toward the exit. The man was heavy, but he felt it not, so impetuously the adrenaline was pounding in his veins. Carola's silhouette was projected on the top of the stairs, her face in the dark second before was gleaming now, revealing a stark horror. Harry had enough presence of mind not to turn, preferring to simply imagine the scene presented to her. The sight of the exit, though, gave him new energy on his otherwise exhausted body to run up the last flight of stairs. Jumping aside, she let him pass. He dumped the dark wizard on the floor, who had fainted in the meanwhile, on which Carola performed promptly an incarcerous spell, leaving Harry free to cast every single piece of magic he could think of on the door, 
to seal it against the destructive power of Finfire. Spell after spell, the door disappeared, enchaining the raging beast underground, doomed to stifle in the dank darkness. The wall gruesome laboratory destroyed, the inferies swallowed by flames. He had managed, he had done it, he was alive, his family safe, the bad man captured. It was over. Chapter 18 Reaffirmation of Vows He strode in the ministry like a hurricane, adrenaline still ringing in his body. He was mid-afternoon and full of people going back and forth. All taken by his purpose, didn't even notice the gapping faces that followed him. Not having any patience to wait for the lift, he took the stairs and taking the steps two at a time, in less than a minute, reached his floor. He felt in a hurry, the spider wasn't any. Usually, after a capture, the wizard in question was left for several hours in the basement of the ministry, under close custody, until he, or one of his colleagues, would bring him to Azkaban, waiting for judgment. Forms had to be filled, papers prepared, a report redacted. It took some time, never having enough staff at his disposal for this petty bureaucracy, but now he felt he couldn't lose not even a second. He wanted the guy in prison as soon as it might be. That capture had cost him too much, the weeds are too sly, he didn't want to take any useless chance. Elizabeth, sitting at her desk, was typing a paper with her wand diligently. She looked up when he got there, like a thunder, and winced visibly. Harry! she exclaimed. No time to lose. I need to fill the form 36B, the 231, a report, and an order of incarceration. He tailed off, darting to his office. She strode behind him. Harry, what? We need to inform the minister, I guess. Perhaps you might do that for me. He gabbled on, sitting and taking a paper from a drawer but then darted up again toward his archive, starting to fumble in it, not sure of what he was looking for, but unable to stay still. Informing of what? I want everything done as soon as possible. He ranted again, darting this time to a cupboard where he got many forms to fill, but not even one of the two needed. Harry! Elizabeth tried again to stop him, slightly alarmed by his erratic behavior. Elizabeth, this is urgent. He bellowed and nerd, knocking off the ink on his desk that pulled on all the files piled to it. Shit! He barked annoyed, taking all the ruined files and sweeping them brusquely from the desk on the floor. Elizabeth ambled over, but instead of bustling over the files or starting filling forms without a clear notion of what happened, as he was expecting, looked straight in Harry's eyes and apostrophized him firmly. Harry! Calm down and sit down this instant. The injunction was given in such a genius bossish way that Harry, out of instinct, headed instantly for the closest sitting, waiting for the next order. Is that your or somebody else? She asked, pointing to his chest. Harry didn't understand straight away, but regaining his wits and looking at his clothes, realized they were covered of dirt and blood. No wonder everybody was gaping at his passage. I don't think it's mine. Who's then? I don't know. None of ours? I believe not. She heaved a breath of relief. Do I gather he had been caught? Harry nodded, still disobeying the manor. She paused, looking at him attentively up and down a few times, and then, arching an eyebrow, asked, When was the last time you got some sleep? Harry thought about it, but couldn't remember. Surely not the previous night. Maybe the one before? He remembered a catnap on the sofa at some point. But when? When was the last time you ate something? Again, he was unable to give an answer. He remembered having eaten something Ginny had left for him, but he wasn't sure when that happened nor what it was. 
Perhaps the soup? Perhaps the day before he got a sandwich? He couldn't quite remember. She mumbled something under her breath on the man's natto when left alone without wife and crossed her arms on her breast. You get a shower now. You leave your clothes outside the door. I'll sort them out. When you'll be done, you'll tell me everything that happened. I'll fill the forms while you eat something. All right? She ordered them. But I'm in a rush. The guy's downstairs and... And there he'll we stay for how long is needed. He won't go anywhere. She tailed him off. Harry, understanding there wasn't any point arguing against his adopted mother, rose from the chair and headed obediently to the bathroom. The hot water on his skin helped to clear his mind and relax his limbs. He hadn't even realized how contracted all his muscles were until they loosened up, how tired he felt until the adrenaline was gone. He left the water slide on his body, taking away all the traces of the afternoon struggle. It formed puddles of pink and grey as blood and dirt were coming off. He watched it absent-mindedly, and for a moment it seemed to him all the strength was gone from his body, carried away by the water, leaving him completely bereft of energy. Even the simple gesture of rubbing his body clean seemed beyond him. He stood there for a while, watching the water that by degree was getting limpid, and then forced himself to get a sponge and a soap. His clothes were waiting clean, warm and neatly folded just outside the door. In one's dress, Elizabeth was waiting for him with a sandwich. Thank you, he muttered taking a bite, his stomach growling with anger now that his body had relaxed. Don't mention it, she said sweetly. Now, she continued with a smile, tell me what happened so I can fill the forms. Harry recounted everything flatly and concisely with all the details he knew she needed to carry out her job. It didn't take long, and when the sandwich was disappeared, he was also done recounting. Elizabeth retired to prepare all the papers. There was a bowl of with some fruit left on his desk, surely from Elizabeth. He took an orange, still feeling hungry, and sat on the sofa. Peeling the zest, his mind was free to wander on everything and nothing. He was so tired, the only fragments of images were bouncing confusedly, incapable to focus on a single object, not giving him the chance to form any real thought. Suddenly, it all stopped as soon as Ginny appeared between those images. Like hunger had wakened with muscle relaxation, the longing for Ginny had reawakened likewise, and it was as intense as ever. He couldn't wait to hold her again. Here you go, Elizabeth said, handling him various papers some minutes later. You just need to sign them, she added, giving him a quill. He perused them quickly without making much sense of it, his mind still dazed by tiredness. He signed them anyway, sure that Elizabeth had done a good job as usual. Can I go now? He asked teasingly. Not quite yet, she answered, chuckling. Your hair is soaking wet. You are going to catch cold. Let me fix them for you. And saying this, she drew out her wand from which a warm stream of air started to sprout. So, planning anything nice for your holiday? She asked conversationally while working on his hair. Actually, I am, he answered smug. He had told her about his intention to get to Wick's holiday if the wizard was captured, but he hadn't had the occasion to explain in detail about his plans. I want to propose to Ginny again. But that is lovely! She exclaimed, excited, her wand almost dropping from her hand. Yeah. I made a mess the first time, and I want to do it right this time. He explains, slightly sheepishly. We are celebrating 20 years of marriage this year, and I want to do a reaffirmation of both. I'm sure she's going to be very pleased. I hope so. A friend of ours is marrying. Luna love good, right? She interrupted. How do you know? He asked, surprised. A magazine. She shrugged. There was an article about Ginny being there, speculating about if you would be of the party or not. Of course. 
Well, he continued, trying not to get annoyed. She was very excited about the preparation connected to it and, you know, we were so young when we married, her mom did everything for us. I'm sure she missed her. I want her to have fun organizing our wedding. They were barely of age when they married, and he was so in a hurry to have it done that it had been a very simple affair, more like a small family party than anything else. He hadn't even worn a too smart outfit. It had been perfect under his point of view, and he had loved it just as he had been, simple and easy. They were only kids eager to start their new life together, and they didn't need anything more to be happy. But he realized now how unconventional all the procedure had been, and Ginny had missed all what Luna was experiencing now. He was sure she would have loved to do it again with an adult mind, and him couldn't ask anything better than to see her happy. This time, it was going to be a proper wedding between two adults. This time, it was going to be a proper wedding between two adults, exactly as she wanted it. For what he concerned him, he would have married her every single day of his life. Elizabeth smiled sweetly. I'm sure she'd be thrilled. When I'm married, she started saying, wanted to explain to him her experience. And it is not that the tape was boring or uninteresting, and normally he would have been pleased to listen to her. But the warm air drying his hair was so pleasant, her voice so reassuring, that very soon it began to sound more muffled by the minutes. He tried to concentrate on it, but the meaning of her words were escaping him. His eyelids felt suddenly extremely heavy. He thought to close them to rest his eyes only for a minute, and that was a certain step to fall quickly asleep.